I, I get the impression from from having known you for a few years that um, early material culture or, or cultural material. at a relatively young age is that a, is that a reasonable assumption? Yeah, I was living in Vermont in the 1970s, and Vermont was going through an extraordinary period of uh, oh ferment growth, uh, environmental movement, historic preservation, interest in crafts, and things that were happening. And so I kind of uh, loved my surroundings and looked around and got very interested in architecture. And then I got interested in the people who lived in the buildings, and then I got interested in the things that the people who lived in the buildings owned. So it was kind of a process of learning to see history as cultural materials, the stuff and stories that make the flow of life interesting. I believe you studied at Wintertour um, through the University of Delaware, uh, which was the former home of the renowned Americana collector Henry Francis DuPont and has one of the great collections uh, of American material anywhere in the world. Um, can you talk about what that experience was like? There was a lot going on uh, all over the country, and really the whole field of antiques was on fire. It was exciting. And Wintertour was exciting. It was just this giant, this guy amassed a, he had a huge, it's almost like Biltmore, this massive estate, and he collected 200 period rooms and furnished them. I mean, it's crazy, but it's great. And and so really, it's not only the biggest collection of early American decorative arts in the country, it's probably three times the largest. And, and so it was like a great playpen, and I w was one of 10 students, and we came from various backgrounds, but it was fun and interesting, and I actually met my wife there. If somebody plays golf, the other finds other things to do. Well, we have the same interests, so we, we never argue about what to do on weekends. We just go to visit more museums and look at more stuff. Uh, by asking you about the, the decorative arts tradition of the Connecticut River Valley, which is really one of the most distinctive in all of early America. Um, where did this tradition come from? Uh, what makes it so unusual and, and distinctive, and why does it happen in the Connecticut River Valley? Great question. Look, this area is fascinating to me because it is, uh, I, I, I describe it as the other New England. And if you read uh, about New England or the way New England is characterized, it's usually like lobsters and Red Sox and things that, guess what, didn't happen here. And so there's a whole nother narrative about New England that is out west, that is the back country, that is interior, not coastal. And because it was interior, this region, uh, the farmland along the Connecticut River, beginning as early as the mid-17th century, was the most productive agricultural land in the New World. I mean, it was unbelievable uh, as a source. And this was at an age when agriculture was the the basis of the whole economy. So the, these were rich, isolated, rich, rural farmers. And that combination of wealth and isolation enabled them to come up with art and a whole approach to art, architecture, and craft that was distinctive and original. And, I, I, you know, years ago I was on a television show about the history of American art. It was a PBS special, and I uh, convinced in America that, that artisans begin creating something that isn't just derivative from English tradition, but comes out of the environment and experience they had here. And so, and it's not just in the beginning, it goes all the way into the 19th century where the Connecticut River Valley has a really distinctive place in the story of our country. And I sometimes think we don't do enough with that, but in terms of the art and antiques, it's breathtaking and it's captured my imagination since I was almost a teenager. So how did you get the idea for the Great River Exhibition? Um, I came to work at the Wadsworth Atheneum in 1980, and I've always been interested in tourism and um, just the business of museums. And I, 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 one of the first things I figured out when I arrived new on the scene is that Connecticut was coming up on a big anniversary in 1985. Now, that might have seemed like a long way off in 1981, but I proposed to the then director of the Wadsworth Athenaeum that we do something big for this anniversary, that that would be a moment where we could really 
get a lot of be in the spotlight and 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 focus on this topic that interested me anyway. Well, he 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 liked the idea, and uh, we had to raise a lot of money to do it, but we wound up with some good luck and we assembled a team some of them went on to become directors of historic Deerfield and historic New England and a professor at UPenn and a professor at Amherst College I mean these were people who were in their 20s and were not yet those positions so we, we assembled a pretty pretty amazing team and it was a great project we uh, visited every small muse museum small and large between Saybrook and Hanover, New Hampshire, and photographed thousands of objects from which we selected the material for the show. And we also um, made 140 private house calls to individuals who was, had inherited local heirlooms. So we our lender list, we had 90 lenders from uh, 450 objects, 90 lenders, and it was a big, big production and something I, I love being part of. Did anything of extraordinary importance that hadn't been known uh, previously surface in, in your researches for this exhibition? Yeah, oh yeah, lots. Of, I would say lots of stuff. And I mean, I think the the, the one of the first things that I wound up writing about and calling attention to were these 17th century six board chests that were distinctive in style and that nobody had written about them. Um, you know, I, I thought the Timothy Loomis material, uh, when we, we stumbled on the business records of a cabinet maker from uh, Windsor, Connecticut, who turns out to have left the largest concentration of accounts and business records of any furniture maker in the 18th century four volumes of account books in the 1780s we have a record of and he built houses he made furniture and uh just the discovery of those account books uh was a really big deal but there were lots of things iron and textiles and you know uh ceramics and nobody had ever pulled together all the different elements of a regional material profile in this way before so it was uh, kind of path breaking in that way as well what was the critical reception like uh well i think you know it was very well attended i mean as well as hartford ever does and that's a whole nother issue i think that uh Hartford and New Haven are both gold mines of American art and material culture and and could be doing a lot more visitation but that's a topic perhaps for another day but we did we did well I think there were 40,000 people that attended this exhibit and um, you know it, it uh, had an impact beyond of course there was a book and we did a, a conference and we had a bunch of programs where we took a bus tour up to the top of Mount Holyoke so people could stand where uh, Thomas Cole painted the famous Oxbow view at the Metropolitan Museum of Art. You know, we did a lot of cool stuff with uh, it. Uh, what is known as a vetting committee, and by that uh, we mean a group of experts that, uh, before the show opens, goes from booth to booth and examines all the objects that dealers are offering for sale, uh, and kind of, um, you know, the, the, the committee uh, basically sees if uh, the description on the tag actually accords with what is there. Um, yeah, for 12, 12 years, the Winter Antique Show in New York is has been, probably still is, the, the, the biggest event in the antiques calendar in the United States. And uh, I was uh, invited to be on the vetting committee and then eventually chaired it, uh, which was really interesting because the committee consisted of dealers, conservators, and museum people. So we would have like, a, I don't know whether it was five of us, but you have a grueling day that starts at eight in the morning, then in our case, sometimes didn't end until 6 p.m., going from booth to booth, flipping things over, looking at them, and sometimes what they would write about things wasn't precisely correct, or we felt needed just a little tweak. Most of the, we didn't, not, changes weren't required most of the time, but when they were, most of those changes involved little modifications to the labeling. Um, every once in a while, we'd stumble on something that we didn't feel was show worthy and felt either there were problems with it or it was whatever. And so things would get pulled. But most of the dealers had great stuff. The show was really exciting and I loved working with this committee, but it was exhausting.